99% of developers don't get fine-tuning. I'd argue that only the 10x developers of today have the intellectual curiosity to know or even care about it. Alright, maybe that's hyperbole. It just hurts my soul to see software engineers on LinkedIn claiming to be AI engineers because they can import ChatGPT. And then there's all these startup founders getting accepted into Y Combinator with literal ChatGPT wrappers with a sprinkle of prompt engineering. Like yes, there is an argument that everything is a ChatGPT wrapper, but you're missing the point. My goal in this video is to actually provide a little more context on some fundamental AI ML concepts, core ones that are driving huge amounts of revenue for the big whales. Sure, training a model might be conceptually simple. Throw a colossal amount of diverse and unlabeled data from the internet into a black box, the AI model, and out comes something like GPT-5. Pre-training is easy, you just use a learning objective like next word prediction for the AI. And if that's all you want to know, then you can feel free to exit this video right now, you laboo-boo lover. But for those with insatiable epistemic curiosity, let's probe a little further, starting with a bit more on pre-training before deep diving into fine-tuning. You may know that during pre-training, the model has not yet learned anything. It's a blank slate. Training begins with a random initialization of model parameters, the different weights and biases applied to the mathematical operations occurring at each node in the neural network. Training occurs iteratively in two phases. In a forward pass, the model makes predictions for a batch of sample inputs from the training dataset, and a loss function measures the loss between the model's predictions for each input and the ground truth answers. During back propagation, an optimization algorithm like gradient descent is used to adjust model weights across the network to reduce loss. These adjustments to model weights are how the model quote unquote learns. The process is repeated across multiple training epochs until the model is deemed to be sufficiently trained. So I'm sure you're familiar with conventional supervised learning, which is typically used to pre-train models for computer vision tasks like image classification, object detection, or image segmentation, which uses labeled data. What this means is that labels or annotations provide both the range of possible answers and the ground truth output for each sample. But did you know that LLMs are typically pre-trained through self-supervised learning or SSL, in which models learn through pretext tasks that are designed to derive ground truth from the inherent structure of unlabeled data? So, to recap, self-supervised learning allows for the use of massively large datasets in training without the burden of having to annotate millions or billions of data points. Okay, now let's dive into fine-tuning, starting with a concrete definition. Fine-tuning in ML is the process of adapting a pre-trained model to a narrower distribution of tasks, domains, or use cases by training it further on a smaller, curated dataset. It has become a fundamental deep learning technique, particularly in the training process of foundation models used for generative AI. Fine-tuning could be considered a subset of the broader technique of transfer learning. The practice of leveraging knowledge an existing model has already learned as the starting point for learning new tasks. A pre-trained LLM such as GPT or Lama has been optimized on massive diverse corpora. It already knows general syntax, semantics, and broad world facts. Fine-tuning does not retrain it from scratch, which requires billions of parameters massive datasets, and huge compute budgets. We leverage the broad knowledge the model already has and refine it on smaller, more focused datasets. So effectively, it updates some of the model's parameters so that an LLM trained on general internet text is fine-tuned to perform better on your specific objective. For example, legal question answering, medical text classification, or even programming tasks. By leveraging prior model training through transfer learning, fine-tuning can reduce the amount of expensive computing power needed to obtain large models tailored to niche use cases and business needs. So it can easily supplement learnings from a model's original training dataset with proprietary data or specialized domain-specific knowledge. Mathematically, given pre-trained parameters theta, fine-tuning finds adapted parameters theta prime to minimize a new loss function L subtask over your dataset D subtask. This reframes the model's probability distribution from predict next token on internet text to predict next token given my domain or instructions. So why not train from scratch? At first glance, it might seem easier to just train a language model from scratch instead of fine-tuning an existing one. However, Modern state-of-the-art models highlight why this is impractical. Take Llama 3, which has 70 billion parameters, one of Meta's most advanced open-weight models released in 2024 as an example. Training a model of this size from scratch requires trillions of tokens, on the order of 15 to 20 trillion, and massive computational budgets, often thousands of A100 or H100 GPUs running for weeks or months. Meta themselves disclosed that training Llama 2 and 3 cost tens of millions of dollars in compute alone, not including the effort of dataset curation, infrastructure engineering, and evaluation pipelines. Instead of redoing the entire pre-training process, we only adapt the model to specific tasks or domains requiring orders of magnitude fewer resources. For example, 
Fine-tuning a Llama 3 8B model on a domain-specific corpus might only require a few billion tokens and can be run on a handful of single-node GPU servers for a few days, well within the budget of a startup or research lab. Okay, so why fine-tune? Fine-tune is useful when you want to embed domain expertise. Say, a medical assistant should use clinical terminology correctly. Or enforce style or tone. Let's say you have a customer support chatbot and you want it to be polite, concise, and on brand. Or let's say you want to specialize behavior. For example, models can be tuned for summarization, classification, or code generation. And finally, you can reduce prompt complexity. Instead of stuffing long prompts, the model internalizes the behavior. By contrast, if the goal is to add dynamic knowledge that changes frequently, for example, company policies or news, retrieval, augmented generation, or RAG is more appropriate. Fine-tuning is best for style and stable expertise. The classic approach of fine-tuning is known as full fine-tuning. So in full fine-tuning, all model parameters are updated. This was very common with smaller models like BERT, which had about 110 million parameters, and is still used for tasks with modest model sizes. This allows maximum flexibility and can yield the best task performance, but it's also not cheap. With LLMs that contain hundreds of billions of parameters, full fine-tuning is often prohibitively expensive. It also risks catastrophic forgetting, where the model loses general language knowledge and capabilities while overfitting to the narrow fine-tuning dataset. And because of these challenges, most modern LLM workflows use more efficient methods. We'll get into parameter-efficient fine-tuning, or PEFT, methods in just a moment. And that moment is right now, so let's talk about parameter-efficient fine-tuning, or PEFT. Instead of modifying all parameters, PEFT techniques update a small fraction of weights or parameters or add lightweight trainable modules. This keeps most of the model frozen, reducing memory usage and speeding up training, while still adapting the model effectively. This reduction in compute cost does not come at the cost of the pre-trained model's knowledge. So first, let's take a look at adapters. Adapters are small neural modules inserted between existing layers of the model into each transformer block. A typical adapter is a bottleneck architecture. It projects the hidden state into a lower dimension, applies a non-linearity or a non-linear activation function, and projects it back up. So we have this equation here where W down reduces the dimensionality, sigma represents a nonlinear activation function, and W up restores the dimensionality. During fine-tuning, only the adapter parameters are trained. The original model weights remain completely frozen. So what are the benefits of adapters? Adapters themselves add very few trainable parameters, so multiple adapters can be trained for different tasks and swapped in and out in a modular way. It's like plugging in a task-specific brain module into an already trained network. So what are some common use cases? Well, domain adaptation. For example, one adapter for legal, one for medical. As we've seen, fine-tuning is a powerful but incredibly resource-intensive process. You can spend weeks or months tweaking a model only to find its struggles in the real world, often plateauing at 60-70% to 70 reliability. This is where a truly innovative platform and the sponsor of today's video, Impromptu.ai, comes into the picture. Impromptu is designed to solve this exact last mile problem of AI accuracy and deployment. It is not just another chatbot wrapper. It's a true no-code AI application builder for creating sophisticated, production-ready applications. The core of their platform is what they call dynamic AI response optimization. This isn't a single black box, it's an integrated system that automatically manages the most complex parts of AI development. It intelligently combines crucial technologies like effective retrieval augmented generation, automatic model selection for your specific task, and the underlying production infrastructure. This holistic approach is what allows apps built on it to achieve up to 98% accuracy right out of the box. So how does this optimization work in practice? Instead of leaving you to figure out the hard parts, Impromptu builds a complete full-stack AI application where these components work together. Every app comes with the best fit model, RAG for accessing your live data, and intelligent processing built in. This ensures every response is contextually aware and highly accurate. The platform includes enterprise-grade controls and evaluation frameworks, allowing teams to define success and let the system automatically work to hit those targets without needing a dedicated ML team. You can simply describe the application you want in natural language, and Impromptu's AI agents can handle the entire development pipeline from logic and data ingestion to the user interface. Impromptu is ideal for developers or businesses that are under pressure to execute an AI strategy but lack specialized engineering teams. The result is a platform that lets you go from an idea to a production-grade AI application in days, not months. If you are tired of the complexities of fine-tuning and want to build AI that actually works in the real world, check out what they are building. You can learn more about their platform in the description down below or the pinned comment. Now back to the video. There's also prefix tuning. 
Prefix tuning works by prepending trainable vectors called virtual tokens to the model's input at each transformer layer. These prefix embeddings condition the model's internal attention layers without altering its original weights. It's lightweight and surprisingly effective, sometimes requiring less than 1% of the parameters to be trained. I usually dislike analogies, but let's actually explain prefix versus prompt tuning using an analogy. Imagine you have a chef in a restaurant. Prefix tuning is like giving the chef a special magical spice rack to use at every step of the cooking process. For the appetizer, you give them a pinch of smoky spice. For the main course, a pinch of savory spice. And for dessert, a pinch of sweet spice. These spices are the trainable prefixes or virtual tokens. The chef's own skills and recipes are the model's original weights that don't change at all, but these small adjustable spices added at every stage or every layer guides the final taste of the meal to fit your restaurant's theme. It's efficient because you're only creating a few new spices, not retraining the whole chef. And let's contrast this with prompt tuning. Prompt tuning is like giving the chef a single clear instruction at the very beginning. You hand the chef a note that says, everything you cook today, sir, must have a French bistro. This single instruction, which is the trainable prompt, influences the entire meal from start to finish. You don't interfere at every step. Conceptually, for prefix tuning, the model sees the prefix embeddings followed by the user input tokens. Only the prefix vectors are trained, not the core model. This acts like a learned context injection that steers the model towards desired behavior. It's extremely parameter efficient, only a few million parameters are used. It works well for tasks like summarization and classification, but is less powerful for deep domain adaptation. Okay, so let's touch on prompt tuning once again. Prompt tuning is similar to prefix tuning, but instead of learning soft prompts at all internal layers, it learns a fixed sequence of embeddings at the input layer only. This is by far the most lightweight approach, often requiring as little as a few thousand parameters. And by the way, hard prompts are human-readable text, words and tokens, that are manually crafted to instruct a language model, while soft prompts are non-interpretable, continuous numerical vectors or embeddings that are learned and optimized during a training process known as prompt tuning. Now let's talk about LoRa, my absolute favorite technique. It's called low rank adaptation, and it's the most popular modern PEFT technique. Transformers contain massive linear projection matrices, for example, in attention layers, query key value projections. Instead of updating these full large weight matrices, LoRa represents their updates as a low rank decomposition. If you've taken linear algebra, then you know that this big matrix can be decomposed into the product of two smaller low rank matrices that are trainable. This means instead of updating millions of parameters, you only learn a few thousand new ones by freezing the original weights and only updating the parameters of the low rank matrices. This decomposition significantly reduces the number of trainable parameters and memory requirements by constraining the rank of the update, effectively capturing the essential changes for the new task with far fewer trainable parameters than a full model update. The beauty of LoRa is that it's highly memory efficient, scales well to very large models, and the trained LoRa modules can be merged into the base model or stored separately for modular use. Here Here's the math, W prime equals W plus B A, where W is the frozen pre-trained matrix, A is an element of the reals with dimensionality of R times D, B is an element of the reals with dimensionality of D times R, and A and B are small trainable matrices with rank of R much smaller than rank of D, and D is the rank of the original matrix. During training, only A and B are updated, and it dramatically reduces parameter count, often by 100 times. Laura can fine-tune a 7 billion parameter model on a single high-end GPU. Another interesting one is RLHF, or reinforcement learning with human feedback. Instruction tuning can make models follow instructions, but it doesn't ensure that they are helpful, safe, or aligned with human preferences. You wouldn't want an airline chatbot saying something racist or homophobic, would you? RLHF adds an additional step to prevent this. First, collect multiple outputs from the instruction tuned model. Then, ask humans to rank them. Third, train a reward model on these rankings. And fourth, Optimize the base model with reinforcement learning, typically PPO, maximizing reward while staying close to the original distribution. This is actually how models like ChatGPT were aligned to give helpful and safe responses. A lot of people get confused about all the jargon. Fine tuning is not the same as RAG. Fine tuning changes the model's weights, making its adaptation permanent. RAG augments the model with an external memory for retrieval. So fine tuning is best for behavior, style, and stable expertise, directly specializing the model on a dataset, for example, medical Q&A. RAG is best for volatile knowledge that changes very frequently. And of course, they're not mutually exclusive. You can have a hybrid approach. Fine tune for tone and use RAG for facts. This is usually used for state-of-the-art production systems. Full fine tuning of LLMs requires thousands of GPU hours, for example, eight A100 GPUs for weeks. Then you have LoRa, adapters, and prefix tuning. This can be done on a single consumer GPU with hours of training. Fine tuning is a spectrum, which I'm also on. 
From updating all parameters, which is powerful but expensive, to lightweight PEFT methods like adapters, prefix tuning, and LoRa that are efficient and practical. If you want to learn how to build Redis, Docker, and compilers from scratch, check out CodeCrafters down below. And if you want to start using the best no-code AI application builder, Impromptu, check out their platform down below as well. If you learned something new in this video, I would highly appreciate it if you left this video a like and subscribe to the channel for more updates. As always, thank you very much for watching this video and happy coding!